Warmest greetings to all members of FIT North America. Thank you to Alan Melby and the team in FIT North America for coming up with this wonderful idea of a webinar on this inaugural UN Recognized International Translation Day. Thank you, Bill Rivers, for moderating this session and all the fellow guests who could join us in celebrating this historic moment. As you know, International Translation Day has been an initiative to recognize and promote the importance of professional translators, interpreters, and terminologists around the world. On St. Jerome's Day, the patron saint of translators. This has been an initiative of the International Federation of Translators, FIT, since its inception in 1953. Many organizations around the world have been celebrating the International Translation Day through its annual competition of theme and posters, as well as events highlighting to the public the importance of professional translation, interpreting, and terminology management. And this is indeed why the United Nations have recognized the role in world peace, understanding and development, the vital missions of United Nations. And we are right at the center of United Nations mission. Later, you will hear from Linda Fidget, my dear friend and colleague, previous president of AIC, on how AIC has been working with UN, especially in the field of interpreting. So I've been asked, what is the significance of UN passing resolution A71 288, recognizing the role of professional translation, as well as enshrining International Translation Day as a UN holiday. I think the event earlier in May, when the United Nations General Assembly adopted this resolution, recognizes not just the importance of translation and interpreting and terminology, but also the importance of collaboration. Why it took place in 2017 can be traced back to the fact that FIT has, in the last few years, increased in its effort in collaborating with partners, sister organizations and specialist organizations to work on dedicated projects on the visibility of translators, interpreters, and terminologists. For example, Linda and I and Maya Hess from MET have been involved in highlighting the plight of conflict zone interpreters and linguists since the Critical Link Conference in Birmingham. In 2015, WASLI, World Association of Sign Language Interpreters, and FIT signed a Memorandum of Understanding. This important collaboration has contributed towards FIT being better known in the sign language world, in the disability world, and as a result, in the United Nations. Our work with the World Federation of the Deaf, WASLI, meant that for the first time in 2016, we celebrated jointly the International Week for the Deaf, which is also in September, as well as the International Translation Day. Similar collaboration has also culminating to joint effort in 2016. In particular, our work with the European Commission the Director General in Translation and Director General in Interpreting meant that we are co-celebrating the European Day of Languages two days before the International Translation Day. All of this had benefited all the different organizations in increasing our visibility, allowing the UN to see that it is important to finally celebrate the importance of translation, interpreting, and terminology. For those of you who were not in Brisbane, I proudly proclaim that UNESCO will be celebrating the International Translation Day in conjunction with the International Day of Universal Access. It is through the collaborative effort that you have heard so far that allows our profession to be recognized. This year's theme is translation and diversity. And you can see from the poster that it also includes sign language greetings, 
and in keywords in indigenous languages. These highlights the importance of collaboration and preview the UN International Year of Indigenous Languages in 2019. Translation, interpreting and terminology encompass all of human condition and interaction. This is the diversity of our profession. There is not, nothing more endangered than diversity. The echo chamber effect and the confirmational bias that increasing automations and algorithm brings makes it all the more important that minority languages, diverse views are allowed to flourish. This is the spirit of United Nations and this is also the spirit of FIT. Of course, I'm very proud to see International Translation Day being recognized during my tenure as FIT president. But make no mistake, this achievement cannot be achieved by one individual alone. Here, I must thank everyone who has been promoting International Translation Day through the ages, who have given us the cumulative effect that in combination with all the visible results of our international collaboration that caught the attention of the United Nations. So let us translate this momentum into policy, into positive action that will not only protect the interests of translators and interpreters and terminologists in member states of it, or just in the rich world, but rather around the world. Promoting the importance of multilingualism, promoting the importance of training professional translators, interpreters and terminologists in national and international security and prosperity. I wish you a fantastically diverse international translation day. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the FIT North America, FIT International and American Translators Association webinar to celebrate the first uh, UN International Translators Day. The official day is September 30th, but this year will be September 28th. My name is Bill Rivers. I am the Executive Director of the Joint National Committee for Languages and the National Council for Languages and International Studies. Uh, in that role, I work in Washington, D.C. to advocate on behalf of all things language to the United States government. And that does include, of course, the role of translators and interpreters, uh, language professionals of all kinds, terminologists, computational linguists, and so on, uh, in all of the various things they do in, in the, the national economy and in the world at large. Today's theme is translation, interpretation, and diversity. A colleague of mine, Hans Fenstermacher, once said, language is the oil of the 21st century. And perhaps that's a, um, not the best analogy, but we are the energy of the 21st century. We are absolutely vital to the functioning of the world economy, to global diplomacy, global security, to social justice worldwide. And we're going to talk about that through the lens of language access and human rights with a very distinguished international panel. It includes uh, Linda Fitchett, who's the immediate past president of IEEC, the International Association of Conference Trans uh, Interpreters. Uh, she's also on the advisory board of Red T, which is an international nonprofit that is very much active in recognizing the role that uh, interpreters and translators play in conflict zones and finding ways to give them that recognition and to protect them. Uh, we have Chantal Gagnon, from, who's an associate professor of translation and interpreting at the Université de Montréal. She is also a certified translator. Her research and teaching on translation uh, includes theory, work on the, the intersection of power dynamics, language ideology, and language policy, and language rights and language access. And Giovanna Carriero Contreras, who is a former staff interpreter, J.D. Edwards, uh, an Italian and translator and interpreter, who uh, about 15 years ago started her own company in Denver, Colorado, Chesco uh, Linguistics, and that is who is very much active in the American Standards Work and of ASTM Committee F43 and International Standards uh, Organization Committee TC37 SC5 on translation and interpreting. We must really stop and recognize the incredible role that FEET and its coalition partners played in advocating the adoption of the UN resolution, the vision of FEET, um, and the personal work performed by Henry View, the immediate past president. As I said, our theme of language and diversity, translation, interpretation, diversity, and language access, we come at this from a diverse set of perspectives. We have conference interpreters, we have practitioners, researchers, advocates, um, folks engaged in standards, a multitude within our small body. Coming from the States, you might think that uh, we've turned our back on diversity perhaps as a body politic, 
But in point of fact, while diversity is perhaps under strain in liberal democracy, um, it's not going away. We can't, you know, take the, the, our collective chairs down to the edge of the sea until the tide not to turn. But uh, tomorrow morning, we'll still have more than 350 languages spoken in the United States, for example. So diversity, while it is under strain, while it is under active attack elsewhere, and we will talk about uh, the dangers presented to uh, language professionals in conflict zones, it's still fundamental to what we do. We recognize language and human rights in a variety of charters, the, for example, the Uni European Communities uh, Minority Language Charter in executive orders and laws the, uh, in the Canadian Constitution and the, the, the laws governing uh, language in Canada in Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of the United States. So there are, in a number of places, there are significant legal frameworks, but I know that Chantal will talk about that as well. So we have reason to think that, that diversity and language access will continue to expand. And finally, I'd say that, that what we understand and what we often end up telling ourselves, and Henry touched upon this, there's a confirmation bias that comes from, uh, comes from our own work and our own perspectives that you know, we think language is great, and we talk about it a lot. Um, it tends to be invisible unless something goes wrong, uh, which happens far too frequently, um, and then it may get some public attention. But in point of fact, language is fundamental. Language access is fundamental in social services, in the, the administration, the fair and equitable administration of justice, in access to economic development. And what we do is as language professionals, whatever part of the, uh, the, the language enterprise in which we work. What we do is fundamental to, is, is fundamentally humanistic and fundamentally humane and fundamental to um, the 21st century and to making the world a better place. And that's kind of unique in, in, uh, in a, lot of, a lot of other industries, people are uh, focused on much shorter, uh, much shorter term things. So I would like to um, turn to Linda and to start, by asking her to tell us about the or her organization's work and the coalition work to recognize and protect, protect translators and interpreters in conflict zones. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, you know that I come basically from conference interpreting. So I am the, you know, as you said, the immediate past president of IEEC. And in January 2009, we had our assembly and some of our members had been seeing press reports from Iraq, Afghanistan, about interpreters being killed or wounded out there during the fighting, local interpreters who had been recruited to work for basically the, the, the coalition NATO forces. And uh, we began to get very worried. We saw all these reports and we thought there was something that we should do. Okay, we're we're conference interpreters, but we also have to see the bigger picture. There are other um, interpreters out there. And these were not professionals, but nevertheless, they were doing the job that we all do. They, they were serving as intermediaries between two groups of people who didn't speak the same language. And they were being killed. So we were thinking that we had to do something. So first, obviously, we created a group. What does one do? One always creates a group. And we created, therefore, our conflict zone group. And we started to think about um, how we could raise awareness about the problem. We adopted a resolution already at our assembly saying that what we wanted was some kind of international legal instrument, which would help to protect these interpreters. And also we had this um, more perhaps long-term idea of creating some kind of new social contract between the public at large, society, and interpreters, linguists. Um, because we realize that we don't have always a very good image, we, we don't always even have the respect or even public awareness of what we do. And so these were the three main ideas which were in our resolution. We created our group and we started to work to try to make contacts. 
Uh, one of our members pointed out to me that they'd seen another uh, website called Red Tea and that they thought that we as IEEC and Red Tea must have some kind of you know, common um, idea because Red Tea also, as you know, is an NG, NGO which is looking to protect interpreters worldwide. So in 2010, there was a meeting of Critical Link International in Birmingham, England. Uh, and I went over there most particularly to meet with Maya Hess of Red Tea. During the conference, we also then met um, Henry Liu of FIT and also um, someone who's a little now out of the picture, but at the time was very interesting. I believe she was had a, a role in the, the administration of the International Criminal Court. And we started to talk about you know, what, what we could do for, for these interpreters. And the first decision was that it might be a good idea to write down a few guidelines for interpreters in conflict zones but also uh, the rights and responsibilities of those people who employ them. And you know, there is a bit of a problem there because the military does not always, in fact, the US military most particularly, does not recruit these local interpreters themselves. They recruit through agencies. So you have the middlemen and the middlemen don't necessarily know a lot either about interpreting, about what we need to do a good job, so on and so forth. So we have the guidelines. And then um, it was Maya in Red Tea, and she conceived of the idea of writing open letters. And that's when we started with FIT, AIC, and Red Tea, writing open letters to governments, not only about the interpreters in Iraq and Afghanistan and the need to protect them, but also about uh, especially translators who were having a rough time in some countries around the world which don't necessarily like some of the things that are translated and find themselves therefore in prison or indeed under sentence of death. So we started writing these, uh, these open letters and this is what we're still doing. And we are also, as you know, um, still advocating for a legal instrument. We as AIC, we managed to get a first mention in um, a European organization's legal text. It was a declaration on behalf of the members of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe is a, is a much broader European body, very involved in human rights. And uh, the mem uh, members from all of the different political parties signed a member's declaration in 2010 saying that we should protect the interpreters around the world. And now we're hoping uh, together with our coalition, which has grown in the meantime, we're no longer just the three members. We are now uh, AIC, FIT, Red Tea, but also YAPTI, the International Association of Professional uh, Translators and Interpreters. We're um, Critical Link International with many community interpreters. WASLI also, the World Association of Sign Language Interpreters. There are six core members now of the International Coalition. And we're now hoping for a UN resolution, which will also say at least something about the protection of interpreters. Um, we would very much like it if something could be said similar to what's been said on a couple of occasions in resolutions in the UN about journalists and the need to protect them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we, we move along gradually with awareness with this kind of thing. In a nutshell, I think that's, uh, uh, that's about uh, what I have to say about how the, the international coalition has developed from from the three associations now to six and lots more uh, bodies which sign our open letters. Linda, this has been vitally important in our work in Washington, D.C. for advocating for the special, visit, the special visa program for yes. uh, translators and interpreters from Afghanistan and Iraq and the 
the fine work that uh, the coalition has done, the data they have provided, have actually proved fundamental to our ability to make the case that that program needs to be continued. We are um, hopeful that, again, for 2018, which officially starts on October 1st, according to our fiscal year, that, that the special visitor program will be continued and hopefully the State Department will, uh, will, will, will execute that program faithfully. Um, you talked a little bit about ethics and the responsibility of the organizations which employ uh, uh, translators and interpreters in conflict zones. That's been a persistent challenge, at least from the U.S. industry perspective, because those, those middlemen, as you say, they, they actually are generally large defense contractors and not necessarily uh, from the language industry. They get into the language industry by dint of holding one of these contracts. Um, for, so I'd like to then turn a little bit to, to Giovanna and, and for some context, the, you know, if, you, if you read the work, the fine work done by the Common, Common Sense Advisory on, um, on the, the state of the language industry in the US and worldwide, the US language industry is about 40 billion a year and 80% of that revenue comes from 6,000 small businesses of which we have one represented here. Um, Giovanna, what's, what's your sense of the role industry has to play in highlighting, uh, highlighting this issue that, that, that Linda, that Maya has, who couldn't join us, uh, she was unfortunately uh, un unable to join us for the seminar, um, the issue of conflict interpreters uh, from standards, from promotion, from, uh, from awareness raising. What's your sense of that? First of all, I totally agree with the with all the challenges and the uh, uh, issues and the problems that still await us to get solved that Linda just uh, um, highlighted. And the fact that years ago, um, interpreting in conflict zones was uh, featured by Interpret America. And I do remember that there were a lot of conversation that were going on around who is training these interpreters and uh, what is the um, framework, the professional framework that uh, are given. And um, also what is fair, what is not fair. More than anywhere else, uh, interpreters that work in these uh, situations expose their lives. And depending on whether these interpreters are locally hired or contracted or they actually come with the trips, they actually follow a different destiny because usually some are taken care of and some others are left behind. So there is anything and everything out there uh, that is happening in, uh, for interpreting and interpreters in um, conflict zones. At the moment, my experience and the way I look at things um, evolving here in the United States, there is a huge social support for these interpreters. Um, from anywhere and everywhere, there is a um, request and, and support for granting rights to these interpreters to uh, be um, um, welcomed in the countries where they, for whom they served. And, uh, some go through faster than others. Some are waiting for a long time. But I really think that there is a still a long way to go to build a support network to make sure that they have all the resources possible, even to continue with that profession if they choose in a completely different contexts. But we still need to provide the support for a professional uh, development here. We know there's a human capital crisis in translation and interpreting, certainly in the United States, and we know we, we simply don't have enough qualified uh, people for whatever kind of translation interpreting we're talking about. That that one very small sliver of a silver lining is that there is a pathway for folks to make a living with that skill that they've acquired at great personal risk. I, I want to just shift gears slightly, Gia, but remaining for one last bit on the subject of conflict interpreting. Um, you have an important role as the chair of the U.S. Technical Advisory Group, the Mirror Committee to 
ISO Technical Committee 37, Subcommittee 5 on Translation and Interpreting. Is there a role for ISO, given that the work of IEEC and Red T and this fine coalition developing best practices? Um, ISO is a powerful international brand, and um, industrial standards, industries pay attention to industrial standards, and uh, they get cited in tenders and, and contracts and things like that. Is, that. is that not a lever by which some of these large defense contractors, U.S. and European and British and Canadian, et cetera, that are hiring these, these conflict zone uh, interpreters, isn't that a lever we could use? Uh, I think so. And uh, like Linda just proved us before, when a big organizations come together, there's a lot of advocacy that takes place. Uh, nobody can do anything uh, alone. This is the, the, the analogy that I use for interpreters. Do you want to, if you could be living one day as an animal, would you choose to be an eagle or would you choose to be a goose? Well, most of us would say, I want to be an eagle. Why? It's majestic, it's uh, um, uh, beautiful, it can fly very high, but you tell me one time that you have seen an eagle flying with someone else. But you tell me if you have ever seen a goose alone. Why do I mention all of this? Because I have an entire philosophy behind this analogy. But, but the, the, the reality is that uh, we can only make this work in our profession as long as we continue advocacy together. As long as we appeal to the professionalism in the professionals to do the right thing. Now, in our industry, where regulation is really low, there is a, a huge impact given by the law of the dollar, of the money, or the currency. There are financial interests that play a big role. So to go back to the role of ISO, um, yes, indeed. Um, there is a huge role that such an organization can play, especially at the, regula the regulatory level. Because as long as uh, the so many businesses, medium, small, and large, still reach out to, to unqualified bilinguals, there is work taken away from the true professionals that could really have a very fair and rich profession in this field. Now, we are having this conversation to honor the International Translation Day. So this is all about inspiring. This is a beautiful profession, whether you are an interpreter or a translator or a terminologist. This is a very gratifying professional profession for all those that really want to do it correctly and appropriately. There is a lot of uh, uh, work to be done. Um, organizations such ISO, AIC, Red T still can get together to continue this conversation and promote the professional identity, the professional development, and the career path that these professions can open because our professions are not stagnant. They are very dynamic. They evolve with the needs. They evolve with the technology. They evolve with the new uh, career paths that are open to us. And so the opportunities out there are countless. Um, but I, I think that we should not forget that when the military go off to somewhere like Iraq and Afghanistan, they need thousands of linguists. And thousands were hired in Iraq and Afghanistan. The big majority of them, of course, by the, the biggest troop numbers and that that was the USA uh, and they hire people who are doing a job I have been often taken to task for calling them interpreters because people have said to me this denigrates the profession of interpreter because these are not people who have learned our profession and also, most particularly, they, they don't necessarily know a lot about our rules, our ethics, this kind of thing, which was why we produced the guidelines in the first place. And I, but I am not sure that ISO 
can really um, legislate for this kind of group of interpreters. I think that is maybe beyond the scope of ISO, at least for the moment, unless maybe jo Giovanna does not agree, but I, I, I'm not sure that ISO can take that up at the moment. So Giovanna, just, just a second, because I want to get to Chantal in, in a minute. And I think we'll come back to this, this point. Yeah. Chantal, um, is it easier to guarantee language access rights in countries that have official policies, official language policies? Um, what, what is your perspective on that? And we will come back, I think, to the issue of, of interpreters and translators serving in, under duress or under difficult conditions um, in, in a little bit. It, it should be easier. Um, Henry, in his presentation, was saying how minority languages should flourish and translation and interpretation should help with that. Um, in, in a bilingual or multilingual institution, there are dominant languages and those are well taken care of, if I can use those words. But true minority languages are not, um, are not cabin for um, in, a, in, in my context, in the Canadian context, you'll have guaranteed rights for francophones and anglophones. And even then, inequality subsides for francophones and even sometimes for anglophones, depending on where you are in the country. Um, but uh, if you take uh, minority languages, like Aboriginal languages, and it, it shouldn't be that way, but uh, there's no services for Aboriginals who should have them. Uh, uh, they've been there for, for the longest time and they have some great languages, um, but there's no translation services. There's no terminology. We're really strong in Canada with terminology. There's no terminology. Um, and that's not even talking about immigrants who come in and need some, some services. There is interpretation, but um, bilingual and multilingual countries have the know-how and, and uh, an infrastructure in place, but they use it only for the dominant languages. And we need symbols like um, a translation day or the UN resolution to remind us that translation is important and imitation is important for all, not only the dominant languages. So your position, and I think probably the position of everyone on the panel, that language access is in fact a basic human right. Could you elaborate on that in light of our foregoing discussion? Yes, of course. I think that uh, it's a it's a human right, um, and it's it's really really important because uh, if you want democracy to flourish, if you want people to 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 really in, get involved in the society, you need them to understand what is going on. Um, the as I said, the problem is because is is that there are power struggles um, going on between um, some languages that are more dominant than others, and it's, it's difficult to get that access. But it is a right to, to, to understand, to have access to some, uh, to, to some services. The legal services usually are well catered for, or they try, they tend to be. Um, help, depending on where you are, sometimes there are some services, but it, it's, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the, the way it is that um, people have to to beg and people have to to look for these services, they should be readily available, and they, they're usually they're, they're not not enough. So I want to shift uh, to to Giovanna and ask for a, a, a follow up, because language access in the United States has evolved very rapidly in the last I would say um, seventeen years uh, since the the promulgation of Executive Order one three one six six by President Clinton. Um, can you just give a, a thumbnail of, of where, where you see us, uh, Jivana, and, and if there are lessons that we can take from the U.S. experience, um, you know, as, as a reminder, under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which itself clarifies the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, uh, which requires equal treatment before the law, um, if you don't speak English, you are guaranteed, in principle, guaranteed access to any social service, um, in fact, any service that receives any federal funding. That works out unevenly um, based on location, language, uh, 
client awareness, as it were, client education being, you know, one of those uh, evergreen challenges. But Giovanni, do you have a, because I know you, you think a lot about this. Do you have a sense of where we're going in the next, uh, the next few years and, and relate that to, um, I think, the, the fact that, as I mentioned before, we have a, we have a tremendous human capital problem in uh, translation and interpreting in the United States. There's something like 3,000 instances of certified medical interpreters, primarily in Spanish. Um, there are more than 350 languages spoken in the United States. We simply do not have enough qualified people, trained people, uh, those who end up s starting a career in community medical interpreting, often even uh, court interpreting in the U.S., often, typically enter that without any training whatsoever. Um, and, and I know Giovanna works very hard on uh, ameliorating that. Language access and advocacy for language access has been pivotal in the last 20, 30 years in the United States. Now, regardless of the political climate, that really remains at the center of a lot of conversations nowadays. Community interpreting, just for those that are not familiar with the term, is what is also otherwise defined as public sector interpreting, public services interpreting, and it's any interpreting that facilitate um, communication between two or more people to access community services such as medical, school, education, um, social services. And uh, it does not matter how you look at interpreting. Interpreting to, to cite one of my biggest mentors, uh, Marjorie Bancroft, is really about giving voice to voiceless. And so whether you speak French or you speak English or you speak an Aboriginal language, an indigenous language here in the United States, it is the right of every single individual to be able to express himself, herself, to be understood and to convey, to communicate, in other words. So I believe that the United States has done a lot of uh, progress in community interpreting. Australia was also another country that had a lot of progress in, the, in this area. And uh, it is also being recognized at the ISO level, where the uh, standards have been issued when the uh, standards 18841 was uh, finally published. And that is the standards on community interpreting. There is a lot of work to be done because sometimes we still work in silos. So all the progress that we can achieve and reach in some areas are not basically transferred everywhere else. One example, there are wonderful examples in the United States of uh, um, training for indigenous languages. This is a model that could be replicated. Now, maybe I'm a dreamer, maybe, yes, so, um, I can be a dreamer. But I want to let, I want to inspire people to think that we do have resource out there that we can um, replicate in order to produce better results. To go back to ISO, to go back to standards, to go back to what we call interpreter or not interpreter in conflict um, zones and uh, what side that interpreter or that bilingual person works on. Interpreting really is about transferring a message from one side to another. And because of uh, regulations, this is not done very effectively from the get-go because the huge percentage of uh, interpreters and translators still get to the profession just because they speak two or more languages. So there is a lot, a, a lot of conversation to still have about uh, training and continuous development. How do we regulate our profession so that our professional identity is not only recognized and a knowledge preserved, but also open path for development? Now, if we compare a community interpreter and interpreting profession to any other profession, I would say that we have a little bit more of challenges because the training, if you only look at how many languages are spoken in the United States or even in one of our states, how we can really provide effective training and effective um, equality to, to, to mention, you know, to go back to what Chantal was mentioning, right? To every single language combination, it's a huge challenge. 
And we recognize that. And that's why, Linda, I do agree with what you said about ISO before. That's why I did not talk about standards earlier in that conversation. I talked more about support and advocacy by the big organizations. So I totally relate with what you clearly stated, and I thank you for that. So to go back to language access, interpreting and uh, being and having a communication that is clear and understood by everybody is uh, a human right because it preserves the dignity of each one of us. None of us would like to talk with someone that does not pay attention to us because they don't understand. Um, there was a very effective video that was uh, uh, posted years and years ago where instead of having as the usual the diverse language in an English-speaking hospital, we had an English speaker, I think it was in a Norwegian, hospital and nobody could understand her everybody has the right to be understood and the language access should find its own way to be developed and be compliant with because there is a lot of work to be done not only to be compliant but also to make sure that that compliance exists Yes, there is the executive order in the United States and Title VI, but there is a lot of also advocacy that we can do around explaining what are the ins and outs of that compliance. Because receiving funds, no matter what program calls you for compliance in all the programs that the organization delivers, regardless of whether or not these programs are open to diverse um, languages. Well, I, I think you bring up, so you bring up a very important issue that, that Chantal started to talk about, and I know Chantal works on in her own research. The US doesn't have an official language policy. We have a de facto language. We have no de jure language, official language. There are states that have, we have a number of states that are officially bilingual. We have a number of states that are officially monolingual, and those are effectively symbolic. Um, because, again, federal law, um, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights trump any state or municipalities attempts to say that we're going to only use English because, again, if they're providing social services, uh, however that's defined, they have to provide language access. Um, and we have this, this, this set of regulations, um, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act and the regulations promulgated last year to uh, to implement it that also impact language access, certainly in healthcare, whether or not it's federally funded. But, you know, I think coming from the U.S. perspective, and I've worked on language access in the U.S. since August of 2000 when the, when the, uh, the, the executive order was signed, um, we're sometimes, I think, taken aback that uh, in other contexts where there are sometimes fairly elaborate official language policies and fairly elaborate protections for um, minority, minority languages and communities resident in, in, that, in that country or region, you still don't have a guarantee of access in the courts, in the medical system, in you know, whatever, whatever kind of um, social service that you're talking about. And, and for that reason, it's part of why ISO um, SC, TC37 SC5 took up the community interpreting standards, took up uh, medical interpreting and legal interpreting, legal translation is, is that it's um, essentially there is no codification outside of a very limited uh, set of contexts, you know, primarily in certain parts of the EU. I'm not entirely familiar with all of the EU uh, contexts, and it does vary from country to country. The, we also in the States tend to think of the European Union as one monolithic entity, which it isn't. Um, the not US, yet. <laughs> not yet, yeah. Um, and, 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 and the, you know, um, the nationalists in Britain are going to make sure that doesn't happen, I guess. But um, <clears throat> I shouldn't editorialize, but I just did. Um, you know, the Canada has a set of policies, the US, Australia, New Zealand, and there's a, a strain running through there of, of uh, primarily an Anglophone with one officially bilingual country, uh, but common law and so on, and then, and, you know, liberal Western democracies, whatever you want to call it. But there, I think there's a growing recognition worldwide of language access as a fundamental human right. And it's compounded by incredible migration pressures, just not just the refugee crises that are affecting um, you know, the Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa or Burma now, but um, large internal migrations within countries that are 
really upending uh, the linguistic landscapes of entire countries, entire you know, uh, multinational regions, and posing real challenges of language access. And so um, as, we, as we look forward, you know, International Translation Day, and as I said, the fundamental humanistic nature, the humane nature of what we do as a profession, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. I don't want to sound negative, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So this comes back to Chantal and your question, uh, the question that we posed to you about whether having an official language regime makes it uh, easier to ensure language access or not um, uh, in, the, in that perspective. But do you, do you have a sense of how that is playing out in the developing world? When, when there is a, a demand for, for language access, uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily um, easy to, to, to understand what the needs are. And I guess if, um, if there are some, in, in, some, in some countries, there will be institutional languages that are official. And these will, the, the needs for these will be, will be catered for uh, first. But when new immigrants arrive, um, I, I, I guess they, they need the resources, the financial resources. Sometimes they don't have it. They need human resources and they don't necessarily have it. So even if it's a, if it's a right, it's, it's a human right. And I think collaboration is, is, needs to be done um, at, at the bigger level than the country. I think it, 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 it needs to be done at, at the, a higher level. And that's why uh, we, we've been saying how we need collaboration among professionals but also among countries and about, uh, uh, it, it has to be done at an institutional level. And it's not at the moment. I think in developing countries, it's, it's the, the problems are particularly acute. And I wanna ask a, a two part question for Linda, following up on Chantal's contribution. Um, first, how, do, how does one get involved with what you're doing for the, the interpreters in conflict zones? And, and second, um, where do you see the, the issue of language access and, and diversity? emerging? I think one gets involved, um, well, simply as I got involved in, in our Interpreters in Conflict Zones group, um, it's by chance and, um, you know, somebody saying, oh, that's a good idea, you do it. Um, <laughs> because I think all of our associations, uh, you know, they, they often come up with very good ideas, um, but then People find it very difficult to give up time from from work, from family, from you know all kinds of things they're involved in, to actually then you know stand up and do something. And it just so happened that at the time you know I had time, so I became the chair of our group, and other people who had the time <laughs> gave their time. And I think that's basically how our associations work, and that's how we we get involved. Obviously, you have to have um, an interest in the subject and, um, and, and think that you are finally going to achieve something. So I think you also have to be relatively optimistic, like, like Giovanna was saying earlier. Um, I, I think that um, to come back to, to Chantal's um, field of work and um, human rights and whether it's easier to work in a, a, a situation where you have policies already adopted. I think that's obvious that it's always easier if there's some kind of a policy that you can work on. Um, I think we shouldn't forget that when the UN adopted the, the Declaration of Human Rights, which was when 1943, something like that, uh, they already said that, you know, it, it's necessary for everyone to have an understanding of these rights in order to bring about uh, freedom, justice and, and peace in the world. Now, how did they expect everyone to have an understanding of these rights if they didn't think that it, it all got to be translated somehow into all the world, world's different languages? Now, I don't know how many, how many languages the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been translated into so, so far. I would think it's five or six hundred. Um, and I think that that is the, the, the kind of thing that we've been building on for years. We've been trying to bring translation into human rights, trying to spread the word, saying, you know, it's not just the few uh, who have rights, that everyone has rights, we have responsibilities as well. 
Um, and I, I know that the, the, the EU is, is, is still not a perfect <laughs> organization, far from it. Um, but uh, with all our different countries, occasionally we do something right. And um, we did adopt legislation in the, Euro in the European Union. And European legislation has to be then transposed into national legislation. Uh, and one thing that the EU decided on was that everyone has the right to translation in a court of law. Uh, now, it's all very well to adopt legislation, but then you have to implement that legislation. And, you know, as the others have been saying, there are so many languages now with globalization, with this thrust of migration, um, that it is practically impossible to make sure that you have professional translation and interpretation, even in all the courts of law. Uh, and if you then get national countries, which I prefer not to name, um, but you know, some, some implement the legislation better than others. <laughs> um, and if it's impossible in the courts of law, where there is legislation saying there has got to be translators, interpreters in the courts of law, how then are we going to get them also in all the other community areas? And the community interpreting is certainly the branch of interpreting which is growing at the moment. It's not conference interpreting. Conference interpreters, you know, okay, we, we still work in the big international organizations and for business and so on. Yes, there's still a market, but our market is not growing, mostly because, as you were also saying earlier, which Chantal, I think, was saying about the dominant languages. And we know, we can see this evening, which dominant language in the world is, right, <laughs> at the moment. But it, it may change. I mean, let's look at world history. What wasn't always English that dominated the world. There have been other great civilizations, so it may change also in the future. But the number of languages that, that you might expect to come across in community interpreting, in legal interpreting, I think we have to be a little bit realistic about what we can aim for. We have to move forward, you know, step by step, get ourselves out there into the marketplace, get more respect for our professions, which we have never really managed to do. It's a very difficult thing because people think, oh, well, you know, you speak two languages, you can interpret. No, you can't. Uh, it takes a lot more than speaking a couple of languages, and one of them is usually a lot better than the other one, um, to, to make an interpreter. And although we have... Uh, we, we do have schools, we have courses, our, our associations try to, to train interpreters. Is it ever going to be enough? Probably not, with the, the thousands of languages and, and minority languages that exist in the world. But, you know, you have to pr pr proceed step by step. And I think, you know, we're doing the right thing. Whether our governments are is another matter. Well, uh, that's the role for advocacy, and it took me probably 25 years to figure out there's no uh, magic bullet that will ever convince government or business or whatever sector of society of the absolute necessity of what we do. We always have to make that case. So I'd like to turn to Giovanna for a couple of last words as we wrap up. I would like to continue segue on the positive note that Linda finished up on, and the whether we work as terminologists, interpreters, or translators, this is a beautiful profession that is of service to others when it's uh, um, accurately done. There is a lot of work to be out there, so if you wanna get involved in any, start, start with your local associations. Like Linda said, uh, find the time. So not all of us have the time of the world, but each one of us can have time to put together at, and work together at it. And so let's be the flock that this profession needs from all of us. And with that, I just commend everyone for International Translation Day. Thank you. Happy Translation Day. <laughs> Happy Translation Day. Yay.